photographers today's video is coming from the hippie hangout um i felt like taking it easy a bit and just uh, i feel more relaxed when i'm shooting in this space with my plants and everything so this week i did a video that was incredibly long it was the most labor intensive video i've done ever it was a complete guide to event photography However, it was 40 minutes long, and while I think it's incredibly valuable, the content that's in it, I know that not everyone does have time, or maybe they just, they're curious about some of my tips, but they're not taking event photography as serious. And if that's the case, this is gonna be the video for you. This video is going to be my 17 event photography tips derived from that longer video, which you should definitely check out if you're serious about event photography. So let's get right into it with our first tip. The first tip is to photograph your life. If you need to build a portfolio, this can be a challenge to get paid work. You need to have a portfolio. To have a portfolio, you need paid work, but that's not entirely true. The best way to build a portfolio is to just start photographing your normal life. If you're going to birthday parties, and I'm sure you are, photograph them. If you go to concerts or festivals like Coachella, photograph them and pretend you're a professional. Photograph it as if you are a pro. It's good practice, it will start building a portfolio and clients do not know if you were the paid photographer or not. Number two is to volunteer your time to the right organization. As a principal, I don't believe in working for free. You should never shoot a job for free just because it's good for you. That's not a good enough reason for them to say, hey, can you shoot my event for free? It's good for you. No, it's not. it might be, but it doesn't mean you should work for free. So what I recommend is you find organizations you believe in, charities, nonprofits that you can photograph things for. These are organizations that might not have a budget for photography, and you can go ahead and do that for them. Build a portfolio, and then also support a cause you believe in, which is awesome. Number three is to learn from a pro. I cannot stress enough how important this can be. Not only are you going to learn the trade, but... You're going to save a lot of time compared to going it alone. If you go it alone, you might be a great photographer. You might have a few great shots in your portfolio without being a professional. But if you really want to learn the trade, you need to work with someone. And it just short, it shortens up that whole learning experience because you can see what they're doing and then you can adapt it. it you don't have to do everything the same way. But what you can do is take what you like that they do and then modify it. That's what I did shooting for a professional when I first started out I learned so much and I learned a lot of that was what I didn't want to do to be honest the studio was a little bit dated and slow to modernize with some of the portraits let's just leave it at that just think 80s glamour stuff but not as bad sort of the 90s equivalent of that so yes take what you like throw out what you don't make it your own it's going to save you a lot of time compared to going it alone Number four is to leverage your connection. So maybe you're lucky and you know like an event planner or something like that, that's awesome. But you don't have to know one to leverage your connections. It could just be people, your friends, anything. Just put it out there that you're a photographer. Put it out there that you're building a portfolio. Number five is to buy lenses first. Lenses are a lot more responsible for the overall image quality of your photography. Cameras, on the other hand, while important, and once in a while there are some ground there is groundbreaking technology that can make a new camera purchase really up your game. For the most part, most cameras are going to be really good, and they depreciate it. They just don't hold their value, and by the time you really know how to use this tool, it might be outdated with new technology. So invest in lenses which hold their value first then get new bodies and try to avoid buying every new body especially if you're starting out i've been doing this a long time i'm still shooting with the canon 5d mark iii i'll put my work up against any new camera it doesn't matter that much when i do upgrade probably to whatever the 5d mark V equivalent will be mirrorless or not that's probably going to be the camera i upgrade to number seven is to buy fast memory cards I remember shooting on the Canon 5D Mark I with these super slow memory cards and while I had no problem with buffers, I spent a whole night uploading a wedding once and it drove me crazy. The read write speeds matter for that as much as they matter for buffer speeds. If you don't buy fast enough memory cards, if you decide to shoot video, you can have issues. For example, I had the Fuji X-T3 for a little while and it kept overheating when I put in the wrong memory cards. I needed faster memory cards. So that's one area I would not cheap out on. Don't 
look to save your money on memory cards. That said, don't overbuy. Your camera may not be able to utilize the fastest read write speeds. So I would look it up, find out what the fastest speeds your camera can benefit from, and then get those memory cards. Think of it as putting in fancy fuel in your Honda Civic. It won't do anything. Number eight has to do with rates. Number eight is set your rates low when you're starting out. And I'm not saying undervalue yourself, but really you shouldn't be overvaluing yourself. You are building a portfolio, you're learning, you sh you're not really gonna get top dollar. So, but here is how you structure your rates. First of all, all the advice online about how to itemize your time and all that, while it may help you understand what your time is worth to you, nobody cares what you think your time is worth. The free market dictates rates, really. So see what the market says. If the rates vary from, let's say, $75 at the low end to like three, four hundred on the high end, you start at $75. You incrementally raise it as you get better, as you build your portfolio, as you gain more clients. And then once you see that you've incrementally raised your rates and at some point you're getting less work, it means you went too far, maybe adjust it, or just don't raise it past where you've already been. Wait till the workflow catches up to the rate you've set. Number nine is to always show up early to a job, always. My personal method for doing this is I look at Google Maps, I live in Los Angeles, it's a long commute anywhere. I look at Google Maps and I double the time and worst case scenario, I get there an hour early, I enjoy a coffee, I relax. Uh, best case, something, or sometimes something terrible happens and for some reason you're really delayed and you end up on time. The other thing about showing up early is that it gives you time to photograph detail shots. And I'm talking about static detail shots like place settings, that kind of thing. The things you can get at any point. So it's good to get it out of the way so that when the event starts, you're able to photograph what really matters and that's the people at the event, the interactions, the emotional moments, etc. Number 10 is to dress to fit in. Don't overdress, don't underdress, but if you're gonna pick between the two, overdress. You do not wanna be the underdressed photographer. You don't wanna stand out in that way. Being overdressed can stand, make you stand out, but in a good way. Just avoid like flashy designer stuff. You don't wanna look pretentious. Just wear a nice outfit. For me, it's always a nice suit. Unless they specifically tell me not to, I'm usually wearing a suit. It's okay to ask if you're not sure. I personally don't ask very often because I've done this for a while and I kind of know how people are going to dress. If I do ask, often they tell me, no, please don't dress up, and then everyone's dressed up and then I feel out of place. That's happened to me like one time where I actually listened to the client and I didn't like it. I'd rather overdress than underdress. Number 11 is smile if you want people to smile. If you just smile, people are gonna smile back. Uh, if I smile at you guys right now, you're probably smiling, though it's kind of hard to do an authentic smile while talking. But you guys get the idea. If you smile, people are going to smile back. Number 12 is to make meaningful images. Never take a photograph just to take a photograph. I've seen a lot of photographers do this where they're walking around, they hit a new angle, so they lift the camera and take a picture. Shoot with intention. Make every image something about something. That could be an interaction between people, it could be a big emotional reaction, it could be anything, but shoot with intention. Every photograph should be about something. Number 13 is to mix your shots up. You're visually telling a story and you do this by varying your shots. You have establishing shots, detail shots, close candids and interactions, and a few more. I detail them all in the longer version of this video where I really get into every shot type, so please check that one out. For now, we're gonna move on. Number 14, if you think it's gonna take you a week to edit the images, tell them two weeks. If you think it's gonna take two, three days, tell them a week. You really do not want to overpromise and then under de deliver. My personal policy is I tell people, you know, it usually takes me about a week and then maybe I'll say, but I try to get it done quicker. But that gives me a week. I know I can get all my editing done within a week unless my workload is heavy, then I let them know and I tell them two weeks. I do it for my own peace of mind. I don't want to stress about editing. I just want to make sure I have plenty of time. It, again, don't let them down. Don't overpromise. You're not doing anyone a favor. Number 15 is to cull your images. Don't put the burden of finding your best work entirely on your client. They need shots that they can actually use, shots that are going to make it into their social media campaigns and their marketing. 
if you put a bunch of ones and twos in there, it's going to be really hard to find the best shots. It's annoying for me to look through it. Imagine for a client to have to look through hundreds and hundreds of photographs and most of them are bad. That's it. So there you guys have it, 17 tips on event photography derived from my much longer 40 minute video that you should definitely check out when you have the time. I have a lot more tips and there's a lot more information in that video, so I do, again, recommend checking it out. Until then, peace and love or whatever, you know, because I'm in the hippie habitat, so peace and love. I'll see you guys soon.